Hi, Margaret. Good to see you. Hello. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to um, watch that video. And maybe I'll stop it in between. I don't know. We might just go right through the whole video. If there's any questions, jot them down if you want to talk about it afterwards, OK? It's going to be interesting. Yes, Anne. Now that I got you all pumped up, let's go. <laughs> let's go. All right. Just going to put it on. And here we go. Welcome to the Holy Land in this biblical site of the Mount of Olives. Right here, we're on the highest point on the Mount of Olives, and there's, and there's here called a Chapel of the Ascension. So this is the place where it is believed that Christ rose uh, and went back to heaven, and he ascended back into heaven, and is here, according to Zechariah 14, that he will return in power and great glory, also Matthew 24. So of all the places in Israel, I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite places because so much takes place here. This is where God will flip evil and make it subservient to righteousness. This is place where Christ is going to come back in power and great glory and reign on this earth for a thousand years with all believers who have received him. So a lot is going to happen here. So we're going to be looking at a few items from scripture here. This is a video is about the end times right here from the uh, Mount of Olives. This is the highest point on the Mount of Olives. And once again, this is a place that is the site that has been marked out according to tradition. And we have to give tradition a lot of weight where in Christ uh, ascended. And then according to scripture, he will return in power and great glory. So it's of all the places, it's one of my favorite ones. So this is going to be a great video. Well, here we are inside this chapel, we filmed outside. So here we are inside this chapel. I wanted to show you uh, this rock right here is the absolute highest point on the Mount of Olives. So this whole chapel, this whole area has been preserved. It's, it's set aside for 2,000 years roughly uh, for, for to remember where Christ ascended from and also where he's going to come back in power and great glory. So this is the absolute highest point on the Mount of Olives where according to Zechariah 14, Christ uh, comes back and touches down and from where he ascended back to heaven from. Now, in order to help you better understand what we're going to be talking about in this video, we're going to give you a bird's eye view of evil. I just want to stop for one second. Now, some of you um, believe that the rapture is at different times, and that's not what we're on here for tonight. Some people say pre-trib, post-trib, middle-trib, whatever. That's not what it's about. Let's just listen to what he's got to say. Your belief of when the rapture is, is your belief, okay? But we're just going to, we want to hear what he's got to say about where we're visiting and where Christ is returning. All right, everybody okay with that? Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Events on God's calendar that have happened and are yet to happen. So Christ came in the flesh and he died on the cross for our sins. That's our, his first coming. Now we're in what's called the present church age. We've been in that now for 2,000 plus years. The next event on God's calendar, and there's nothing that needs to happen in order for this to take place, the rapture of the church. This is where Christ comes in the clouds. In Thessalonians, he comes in the clouds, and the believers go up in the air, and they meet him in the air, in the clouds. And then what's ushered in next is what's called the Great Tribulation Period. In Daniel 9, 27, the Antichrist makes a pact with many for seven years, and this launches us into the Great Tribulation Period. Period. Now, it should be noted that the first half of the Great Tribulation period is a time of peace. This Antichrist makes a pact with many, a covenant with many for seven years, but the first three and a half years is a time of peace. Then in the middle of the Tribulation period, he goes into the temple, a functioning temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, and he declares himself as God, sets himself up as God, demands to be worshipped as God, and institutes the mark of the beast so that people can't buy or sell unless they receive the mark of the beast. And at the end of the Great Tribulation period is when Christ comes back 
on the earth, touches down on Mount, uh, the Mount of Olives, uh, Zechariah 14, 4. The armies of heaven come back with him, Revelation 19. We come back with him. The angels come back with him. And he comes and touches to the earth, separates the sheep from the goats, and then sets up his millennial reign on earth that will last for a thousand years. And of course, the angels and we in our new supernatural glorified body, we will reign with Christ on the earth over those who came out of the tribulation period who would receive Christ during the tribulation period. So he sets up his millennial reign. He, he uh, rules with the rod of iron, which means perfect justice. During the millennial reign at the beginning, uh, Christ binds Satan and throws him into this pit and seals him for a thousand years. And at the end, uh, he's loosed. He comes out, deceives the nations, rebelling against God. God wipes him out. And then you have the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20, the destruction of the heavens and the earth, the creation of the new heavens and earth, and then eternity future in either heaven or hell. So we're going to be talking somewhat in this video about the second coming of Christ at the end of the great tribulation period when he comes back in power and great glory. So this gives you an overview of what is to come, what is to take place on God's calendar. Um, as we said, uh, this is a culminating place where tremendous things happen. So the return of Christ back to this earth, his second coming to this earth, will be one of the greatest culminating events that ever happens on the history of this earth. You have to understand that Christ created uh, that all creation. He created mankind. We had a fall. We had his plan unfold. We had a redemption in Christ who came back the first time riding on a donkey, meek and mild, who came to save, offer his blood, to die on the cross. But he says he's coming back again, Matthew 24, many prophecies that talk about him coming back, and he'll come back in power and great glory. So this is where it all takes place. So this is, in essence, one of the, the most dramatic culminating events of God wrapping up his plan for this creation, this earth, and mankind here before he creates a new heavens and a new earth after the millennial reign. So it begins right in Christ's return and Christ's judgment at the end of the uh, tribulation period. What we have before us is a great tribulation period that will happen. It says in Daniel 9:27 that that uh, this Antichrist will make a pact with many for seven years, and that launches us into the tribulation period. So we believe in a literal um, prophetic fulfillment of scripture. So we're not taking anything in this sense as figurative, we're taking it literal. So that's going to be our uh, perspective as we uh, tell you and unfold in this video here. So in Revelation 1 7, it says that every being who has ever lived, even in demonic uh, hell, will be opened up to see Christ coming back in power and great glory. So it says, Behold, he is coming the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierced him and those people are in hell right now and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him even so amen it says and in uh, revelation 1950 the return of christ uh, conquers and flips all evil powers as we said it makes them subservient and in submission to Christ. It says in Revelation 19, 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword uh, with which he will strike down all the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And Christ coming back, his second coming after the tribulation, will he, he will come back in power and extreme glory. Follow along as you read this in Matthew 24, 1. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, this is talking about the great tribulation period. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. Uh, the moon won't give its light. So you have a, a dark uh, universe, uh, the moon not giving its light, and the stars will fall from heaven. And the powers of the heaven, heavens will be shaken. So you have a pitch black universe that is just trembling as, they get, as the stage gets set for Christ to come back. And it says the powers of the heaven are shaken. And then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. So Christ comes back in power and great glory. 
and it says all of the nations and all of the, all the people will see him. And in Revelation um, 6, uh, 16, it says, when he opened the sixth, sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. So once again, they have a black sun that doesn't give us light and the moon will become like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. So it's the same imagery, the same context, the same uh, scene that is being described in Revelation, just using a few different words. And, and the full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit, shaken by a gale. And the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. And the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide on us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? So then Christ comes back in power and great glory. And it says in um, Zechariah 14, 1 through 4, it says he touches down right here where he ascended. It says um, 14, uh, 1 through 4, it says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, on that day, Zechariah 14, uh, 4, on that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west by a very wide valley, so that half of the mount shall be moved northward and the other half uh, southward. So Christ literally touches down here uh, when he returns in power and great glory. Now, Scripture also says, that the believers will return with Christ in power and great glory as well. So in Revelation 19, 11, it says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and his head are like, uh, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. John 1, 4, he is the word of God, became flesh. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, talking about the believers that come back, uh, white and pure, uh, were following him on white horses. So if you're a believer and you're following Christ, then you will come back to this very spot with Christ riding a white horse along with him. And it says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he will strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread, he will tread the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. So when he comes back, it's judgment on the unbeliever. And on his uh, robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So he goes on and he says, come gather for the great supper. He talks to the birds, says, come gather. And uh, the armies are gathered together the kings of the earth to make war against Christ, led by the Antichrist. And they all gather around to make war against Christ, part of the, in, in the Valley of Armageddon and the Valley of Jehoshaphat or the Kidron Valley. All around this area, the nations are gathered to make war against Christ, but he comes back in power and great glory and just absolutely crushes them. And it says um, in uh, verse 20, it says, And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And the birds were gorged with their flesh. So Christ comes back and judges the unbelievers. And uh, Satan and the uh, false prophet and the demons are judged. Satan is cast into uh, a bottomless pit and held for a thousand years. In um, yeah, also, it says that Christ will judge the nations and he will separate the sheep uh, who are believers from the goats who are unbelievers. So that happens right in the Kidron Valley, right below this Mount of Olives that we're standing on. It says in Revelation 14, 20, it says, Then I looked and behold a white cloud, 
and seated on the cloud was one like the son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand and another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud put your sit put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe so what we have is an earth that is moving towards more and more uh, sinfulness, evil, uh, uh, rejection of Christ, uh, immorality, uh, murder, uh, just absolute chaos. And uh, so uh, it says here that now the, the, the harvest is ripe. Now it's come to a point where God says enough. He comes back and he puts in his sickle and he reaps for the hour. Uh, has come and the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the clouds swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar and the angel who has authority over the fire and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth for the, 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 the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered a great Great harvest of earth and trodden outside the city in the blood from the For 1600 stadia, which is about 200 miles. Uh, so, what it would do is that all of this takes place, this wine press is right in the, the bottom of the Kidron Valley in between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount, the old city of Jerusalem. So, that's where uh, the wine press is at. In fact, uh, that's where the Garden of Gethsemane is, and that's where the olive press was. That's where Christ sweat great drops of blood. So in that same Kidron Valley is where this judgment takes place, and this wine press happens, and it says the blood runs out of this area for 200 miles, so it will go down towards Jericho. It will go um, east towards the uh, Dead Sea, then run south down to the Red Sea. So that would be 200 miles, so it goes down and uh, then it goes south, east and then south. So uh, 200 miles up to the horse's bridles, and the blood runs. So it is an absolute uh, horrendous site where I say uh, the, the nations are gathered together in this wine press of God's judgment uh, upon them. So uh, this, the judgment on unbelievers will be severe. And here's just a partial glimpse of what it will be like in Zechariah 14, 12. It just gives us a glimpse. It says, and this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem on that day. Their flesh will rot while they are standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. So in this wine press, it's almost like they just dissolve. They're just absolutely crushed. Um, and then the goats go into the lake of fire. So their, their, their bodies are uh, rotted and consumed, the blood runs out, but their spirit and their soul then goes into the lake of fire. And then the believers who come back with Christ and their supernatural bodies and reign with him for a thousand years, they come back on the white horses and they will reign with Christ right here from Jerusalem uh, for a thousand years. And then that those that receive Christ during the tribulation, those are the sheep, they will go into the millennial reign in their natural bodies. And then Christ will reign over the earth uh, for a thousand years and the uh, people that went in in their natural bodies into the uh, new millennial reign uh, then they will populate the earth once again in a thousand years and they rebel against god he wipes them out and then uh, he um, cast uh, satan into the lake of fire forever so what can we observe about what has taken place right here every being that has ever been created will see christ return in power and great glory so Revelation 1, 7. So in Christ's second coming, every being that has ever been created, I believe even the demons, all the demonic world, Satan, uh, everyone in, in hell, there won't be one being, rational being who has ever been created that will not witness Christ's second coming. And it will be in power and great glory. It says that at that time that Christ uh, returns, in his return, he, he conquers and he flips evil. That's where evil is conquered. And now it is submitted to Christ and he rules with the rod of iron. His coming will be in power and great glory. He said, uh, the sun will be dark and the moon will be white. All and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. It says, as the uh, as the lightning flashes from east to west, then shall the, the appearing of the Son of Man be so. Everything will be dark, shaking, 
and then in a brilliant uh, mm -hmm. ray of glory as the lightning and just Christ's presence just lights up the whole universe and he comes back in power and great glory and we who are believers along with him riding uh, white horses so uh, believers and angels will return with Christ and then Christ will judge all of the nations in the, in the Kidron Valley or the Valley of Jehoshaphat uh, he will return right here on this place. This is the highest place on the Mount of Olives. So right here is where he ascended. And this right here is where he will return in power and great glory. The mountain will split in two. And um, it's just absolutely incredible. It just makes me uh, shudder to think that I am standing right here in this place. And one day I will return with him in the clouds of heaven and touch back right here with my glorified body right here on the Mount of Olives. So, uh, you know, this uh, makes me ask myself some questions. I really have to ponder uh, this reality. Um, am I living a devoted life? Am I living a, a life that is really serious about following Christ? Am I a real true disciple of Christ who's not following my cult, but I am really uh, locked into following Christ? Uh, am I watchful and ready? Christ said to be watchful and ready, but you don't know the hour, the day or the hour. And um, so, uh, it just makes me uh, reflect and kind of really pause about uh, my life and hopefully maybe uh, you as well. So anyway, uh, fascinating place. Uh, one of my favorites in all of uh, Jerusalem because so much happens uh, right here. So I hope that you've enjoyed this uh, video. Uh, God bless you and thanks for watching. Second. When all foundations have been shaken, have been shaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One second. Okay. So most of you are muted. You can unmute yourselves. And let's chat about what we just saw. Let's talk about this. Um, what did you think about seeing that location? That's cool. That is cool. Mm -hmm. it's, and, and to know, like he said, he kind of trembled just being there mm -hmm. with excitement and anticipation. Um, and that, my friends, is not something that's made up and possibly a mistake because that is scriptural that is where it says he's going to be returning right there on the mountain of olives and um you know i i, I looked up a, a lot of stuff before this so I could share things with you but it, it says like it's gonna, it's gonna where he comes back he's gonna be standing and it's gonna split mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's going to split and and part of it's going to go to the north and part to the south and um the whole earth is going to be in an uproar isn't it yes it is when it talked about the um blood running for 200 miles i think that's what it said 200 miles runs. And it, it even gave the location, right? It tells you. Mary, I'm sorry, but it's echoing. I'm breaking. So, what's that? Go ahead, Margaret. You're breaking up sometimes. Yeah. Am I okay now? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, for some reason, Mary's connection was causing it to break up like that. So I, I muted her. Um, so the Mount of Olives, um, does anybody have a Bible in front of them that they could read for me? Just one verse, Acts 1.11. Who's got a Bible? Anybody? Okay, can you look it up? Acts 1.11. Mm 
You're okay. Oh, she just muted yourself. There. <laughs> <laughs> Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall come so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So he's going to go up. He went up and he's going to come down right where he went up from. And that is the location. Um, for Jews, it's a that whole area um, is kind of a cemetery for the I looked up what. What's the importance of the Mount of Olives for Jews and Christians and anybody else who is in that area? And for Jews, they, it's a cemetery for over 3,000 years, that whole area, with over 150,000 graves in that area. And that includes prominent kings. I, I wasn't able to get the names of the kings that are actually buried there. But it's a very prominent area. So it's a special place that God has chosen. That's why the kings are buried there. Jesus went ascended and coming back right from that area. And in that area, when um, both David, King David and Jesus had something very much in common, they were both rejected in Jerusalem. And the thing is, is that when Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, he went there often, and he went to pray. And when he went to pray, he prayed for the sins of others. <clears throat> David also went to that same location, which I found interesting. And when he went to pray, he went and mourned for his own sins and the sins of his family. So I thought that was pretty close. Jesus went to pray. Obviously, he didn't have sins, but he went to pray for the sins. And David went to pray for sins right at that same location, which to me sounds like it would be a very holy location in God's eyes. Because they both went to the same spot. That's where he, Jesus ascended. That's where he's coming back. That's where so much is happening. Um, what else did I write down? The Jews and the Christians look at the Mount of Olives as a place of hope. Now, the Jews aren't looking for Jesus to return, but they know that there's something special about that place. It's a place of hope. And um, Zechariah prophesied that Jesus would return right there. <clears throat> and that's in Zechariah 14.4. He reminds us of Christ's returning, of the return of the Messiah right there. Now, the other thing that I found, found interesting was, remember, when we saw the Mount of Olives, you could look over and see the Kindron Valley. The Kindron Valley, the Garden of Gethsemane is there, right in that area. The other thing is that they're pretty sure that that is the valley that David was talking about when he said, although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Because Kindron means blackness and mourning and death. So this, <laughs> the studies are showing that that is more than likely the valley of the shadow of death. And I know we look at that when we say, although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we think of it as like, though we go through trials and tribulations, right? That we kind of think of that when we read that. But it, they're saying that that actually, when David was saying that, that that is what he's talking about, even though he walked through that valley of death and mourning and blackness. So I thought that kind of went, was very interesting to find out. Um, Let's see. Oh, what did you think about where he said that when Jesus came back, comes back, where it says every eye will see him? What do you think about where he mentioned that he even feels every person that 
ever lived, including those in hell and those dead, <clears throat> all eyes will see the return of Christ. Let's talk about that. What do you think? Because we're supposed to study and question things, not just sit back and believe it all. <laughs> Probably because it's going to be a bright light. A bright light, brighter than anything we've ever seen, anyone's ever seen on this earth. It makes me think about when we studied Enoch. Remember when the light came and he said to mm -hmm. uh, bring himself out or whatever that word was, like, almost like manifest himself, that light. So every eye will see, even those dead and even those in hell. Because oh that's certainly going to be a real struggle and more suffering for those people like, oh my gosh, it was true, you know, <laughs> they're going to uh -huh. see all that and it's going to be horrible. Um, <clears throat> he mentioned that we will come back with him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that there's going to be many armies coming up against Jesus, but what's going to happen? What, what, what did, what did he say tonight when all those armies are coming up against Jesus? What, what's going to happen? All of us will fight. We're going to fight, and there's going to be armies, and he's, they're going to just be wiped out like that. Right. This isn't the little baby in the manger anymore. He's coming back to judge. He's coming back powerful. Amen. And he's got the word of God. He is the word of God, and he's coming back in power and in strength. And it says he's going to have a crown on his head when he's in the clouds people are going to see that and he's going to it's going to be the hour to reap it's going to be the hours it's come when that happens right there on that location so even though you're not in israel and you haven't stepped on that location and, and hopefully maybe we all will get a chance someday but we have seen it now with our own eyes. It isn't just imaginary. You have seen the spot. You saw looking over and down in the valley, the valley of death. In my valley. Um, says that there's going, uh, the judgment this time will be really severe. Patty? Uh, it just hit me that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone will confess it when he comes again. And I think he will come in majestically. He'll just be coming to, to be with the children of men. And that it will be one of the glorious days that we will have is to see that. And I think we have to live our lives in, in order to, to get to that point. Yeah, yeah. The, the guy was saying that he was teaching he would want to see that but you have to get your life in order to see that you know yeah. I don't know what I'm trying to say but that's what I'm trying to say no. I guess <laughs> you're exactly right you're exactly right um <clears throat> the spirits that that he's coming to judge and God is a loving judge and God is a good God and God is a good good father and all the things we say about God but he's also the one who judges and he has given us all this time, all this time to get our acts right. We still yeah. got a little time guys. I love what um, the pastor said there about even he's examining his own self. And that's what all of us that are on here right now, there's a uh, 12, 13, if we can reg and, um, Tara and me and Larry, there's about 15 of us here right now, at least. I'm not All of us. Are we living serious? Are we living serious? Are we, are we locked in to serving God? Or are we wishy-washy? That's what I tried to teach for any of you who are on the pastoral studies uh, last night. How we... We have to be firm in our in our walk. There's no time left for all this la 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 and one minute I'm this way and one minute I'm that way and 
I'm up, I'm down, I'm sideways, I'm rolling over. I mean, this is crazy. There's no time anymore. We, we just watched that whole thing. We saw where he's going to come back. We heard, you know, you can study Revelation until you're blue in the face, and, and it's not easy to understand. But Pastor Fink just gave us a, 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 a synopsis of what's going to happen. We can't say we don't know. So what are we doing? Are we watchful? Are we watchful? Because we don't know when it's going to happen. And, and <clears throat> we have to pause where we are right now. Every one of us on here tonight. Just pause for a minute and think about your life. Do you, are you tight with God? Do you yell and argue over silly little things that don't matter anyway? Do you trust God for everything in your life? Are you serving him? Are you serious? Are you serious? Because we just saw all this. We, we, we can't sit back and say, you know, oh, I've never been to Israel. I don't know what any of that's. We just saw it with our own eyes, just as if we walked there. Not quite, but almost as if we were walking there. It's real. And we, we need to, to put it in our language. We need to get our act straight. Amen. <clears throat> we, when, when God puts you somewhere, calls you somewhere, if it's a little spot for him or it's a big spot for him, you can't play a game in it, guys. You got to stick with it. He sticks with you. He doesn't leave you. Ever. <clears throat> when was the last time God left you? He doesn't leave you. And we got to get serious. Um, does anybody have anything? I know I asked you to talk and I'm doing all the talking. I can see your hand going like this. But <laughs> are, we just, are, you, are you orchestrating what I'm saying or did you want to talk? <laughs> there was a time when I had said and I got it partially right and partially not enough, but on his, on his second coming, he's not coming to save. That's over with. He's coming to judge. So between the present and when he comes, all his works that he's given us to do is still doable. And all the ways that he's going to reward us are still rewardable. But there's no more playing games. Exactly. He's going to be coming for judgment. Yes. Did you do what I asked you to do? Did you follow my commandments and be true? Did you help the lonely, the tired, the old, the orphans? Did you feed them? Did you do everything that you were supposed to do? Because if you didn't, I never, I, I can see him saying, I never failed. And I never gave you a weakness to fail. I gave you a strength and a job to do. Did you do it? Yeah. So the salvation call is at that point in time is non-existent. You can't barter your way in. You can't buy your way in. It's the day of judgment and judgment will reign. And for us that have studied Enoch, we know what the judgment is going to be. It's not going to be pretty. And me, for one, I don't want to be there mm -hmm. on judgment day. Mm -hmm. I do not want to hear, I never knew you. That's the last words I never want to hear. Right. Is, I never knew you. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, Patty? Yeah, and I was the one that on too that um, a thought hit me um, that we're, when he, we're here on earth and that we have all these tendencies 
we have riches and things. You can't take it with you when you die, right? You cannot take all these earthly possessions that you have. But one thing I've learned is, is how you treat others and how you live your life and what you learn from God. And that's what you take with you. That's your greatest treasure. That's where you laid up for your treasures in heaven. And that's what he's going to judge that. He's going, you're going to stand before God. And you're going, he's, going, he's going to judge you for that. He's going to judge us for everything that we've ever did to anybody or said anything or did anything out of the way. And he's he's like Brother Larry says, he's he's not fooling around. It's, it's, yeah. it's done. Time is done. Time is over with. Yeah. You know? Well, that's why if you notice a lot of the sermons I've been doing lately, they're a little hard. They're a little they're they're telling it like it is. But it's because I love you. And it's because God's like not just encouraging me, but like pushing me that those I, I try to look at sweet little things to say, like messages, but there's a lot of pastors out there just with their big smiles and and in saying what people want to hear. They're not talking about blind spots. They're not talking about getting along with people. They're not talking about loving one another. <clears throat> They're talking more about loving yourself. And that is not what God wants from us. So anything else you want to talk about what we learned tonight? I thought it was very good. I love to see Israel. The chance I might be going there this year. I don't know. We'll see. I'm curious, to, curious about the tower. Would, um, any idea when that was built? When it was built? No. Uh -huh. um, you mean that actual building that was yeah. around? It? Yeah, no. the actual tower. No, we'll have to look at that. We'll look that up. I don't know exactly when that. It looks pretty old, but I don't know when it was built. What, what, was its purpose just to just to like keep that where Jesus landed at uh, or took off from uh, safe and just kind of cordoned off, or what was its purpose? Any idea? I I think what I had read when I was at it before I decided to show it was that it's it's just put there so that especially that one area that they say is actually the highest peak that they've got kind of surrounded it's mm -hmm. it's where they want to keep it separate and holy probably where nobody else goes to it I mean I I have no idea I don't know if they charge to get in there it could be a, you know a tourist attraction I don't know mm -hmm. But it is the location, the highest spot on the Mount of Owls. And, you know, can we say 100% that that is the exact spot where his foot's going to come? Well, we don't know. But he is coming to the Mount of Owls, and that's where that is. Um, I would imagine it's a big mount. So is it that exact one spot? It, we'll know when, when it happens. But uh, <laughs> so a lot of what we hear um, too, you know, where we get afraid that are we living in the tribulation now, and is this happening? And but certain things do have to happen. You know, are we in a in the tribulation at this particular moment? Um, it, when is the rapture going to happen? Those are all things that we can all talk about. But we don't know for sure. What we do know is he <clears throat> ascended and he's coming back and he's coming to that location and why he's coming back. And then he's, it's not going to be a pretty picture. Oh, it's going to be glorious. That's why I played, played that song, Oh, Glorious Day, right? <clears throat> it's going to be glorious. But is it going to be like a big party? No, it's going to be really battle and kind of sad it's going to be death a lot of death mm -hmm. so as i said we have to evaluate ourselves i can't evaluate you you can't evaluate me you can't evaluate your spouse you can't evaluate your kids you got to look at you no matter what we try to do, we can talk to our spouses, we can talk to our kids, our cousins, our parents, whoever we want to talk to. <clears throat> but we can't force them to do anything. 
the only person that we've got to look at is we've got to pause our own life. What did we do today for Christ? What did we do today for ourselves? How did we treat the people around us today? What did you do? Did you hurt people? Did you make, did you say awful words to people? Did you not help anybody? If you had an opportunity, did you? I mean, some of us are in the house, you can't, what are you gonna do? But if you had an opportunity to even smile to somebody, are you bringing joy? Are you bringing Jesus to people? What are we doing? You know, years ago, that was what life was all about. When you became a believer, you shared God wherever you went. Didn't matter where you get. And, and, and you didn't walk away without your Bible in your hand. You always had your Bible. Now it's like people maybe are ashamed. I don't know what it is. Or we say it's on our phone. But I'll tell you something. When you walk into a room and there's a hurting person, and they see a Bible in your hand, there's a good chance they'll come to us. They're really seeking out God that they're going to come up to you. Mm -hmm. If they see the phone in your hand, they won't know one way or another, will they? Mm -hmm. They won't know what you're looking at. When you have your Bible, it's the same with um, wearing a cross. <laughs> or, you know, uh, my brother used to wear a real big cross, real, like that big. Why did he do it? Because he said, he, my brother dealt a lot with people with addictions and al you know, alcohol and drugs and a lot of really hurting people. Why did he wear that? Because if he went somewhere and somebody was half out of it, they would identify him as a man of God. And they'd go to him and they did often because they knew that he was a man of God. So what are we doing? Doesn't mean you got to go out and buy a 10 pound cross and wear it or a 50 pound Bible. That's not what I'm saying. But are you manifesting the presence of God? Are you locked into him? And let's start with ourselves. And then let's look around at our family members that we live with. And let's look at, you know, every... Like a lot of us on here have animals. Well, why do we have animals? Because we love, we love. So we love people, we love animals, we love the little fishies, we love the doggies, the birdies, whatever. We love, you have a lot of love for people. That is showing Christ, that's living for Christ. I don't mean you have to go out and buy an animal. I'm just, I'm using that as an example. <clears throat> so, what more can we say, somebody? If somebody's call, if God somebody, if God is calling you to do something, are you gonna do it? Oh, yeah. No matter what it takes. No matter what it takes, guys. Do it. Well, I got a little little praise report to tell you. What's I'm that? I'm still here. I'm still here today. So That's like, right. so I'll tell you what I, why I say that is because um in this room, for some reason, this light socket over here, if it gets jiggled a little bit, the lights will go out in here. So I decided, well, you know what? I got to go do some stuff back there anyway. And I'm going to just take it apart and see if something's loose on it or what. And so I went back and I flipped the breaker off. And I'm, I, I took and wiggled the thing, make sure the lights are coming back on and off and make sure, you know, make sure it was off and nothing, nothing lit up. So I'm over there messing, have a head, have headlight on and was messing with all the wires and Fiddle, fiddle around with them and uh it, it looked okay to me so i put it back in put it back together and went and flipped and and uh, oh I'm, i remember what it was when i when i put the uh the the light cover switch on it the lights came on i had turned off the wrong breaker oh <laughs> oh my God. oh wow <laughs> i turned off the breaker for another room thinking it was this one <laughs> We were in the middle of playing with electricity. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was you it, never to play with electricity. You would think. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting too. It's like, uh, you know, we've been praying for my dad. I said, well, dad, I got another, I, I got something to tell you. I said, I've got something to prove there's God. I told him all about it. He goes, well, oh. <laughs> didn't know what to think. Yeah. Well, yep. that, that, 
right there as a witness to him that you were every little every little experience I get. That's right. Everything. That's amazing. And I am grateful to God you are here. Yeah. <laughs> we need you. We don't want anything yeah. happening to you. We need all of I you. Believe, I could not believe my mind that I was messing with live wires the whole time and didn't. Wow. Didn't know it. <laughs> wow. We love you, but you're not quite right. <laughs> no. <laughs> I just need to know which rooms are actually to the things on the person. So, okay, anybody else want to um, testimony, say anything about what we learned? <clears throat> I actually have a praise report. Sure, go ahead. Um, I'll drink to that. <laughs> <laughs> My my friend Dottie um, was seeing certain kinds of spirits and shadows on her house. And I prayed over her house from, from being on the phone FaceTime. And that was like four days ago. And yesterday she said that she hasn't seen anything or heard oh, anything good. ever since then. So that is amazing. That's, a, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And that shows the power of God again, right? It's not the power yeah. of God the power of God working through you Amen. <clears throat> and you were obedient to do it oh, right yeah. oh yes that's great that's good to hear anybody else no um Eddie apologized Pastor Eddie for not being here um his Charlie had to have their dog one of their dogs put down today and um, they decided to how they managed to get this done so quickly but it was also cremated today and they were taking the dog to its favorite park and letting the ash so he said you know he he had to be with his kids with the dog. so he said he was sorry but he'll want <laughs> Hey, Jay. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. How you doing? How you doing again? He's looking so good. Yeah. I don't know if you all remember. That's the baby that yes. had all those horrible blisters all over his feet. Did you remember? We were all. Oh my goodness! Is that the baby? That's him. Look at him. Look at him. He's healed. Praise God. Oh wow. Yeah, and he has a very dedicated, uh, loving sponsor who looks care of, uh, takes care of him, and uh, right. loves him so much. And look at him. That's awesome. Yeah, thank God. Wow. We're so happy about that, Kathy. We're so happy. <laughs> okay, anyone else? So everybody is going to remember what we studied. You're going to apply it to your life, right? Amen. You're going to say to yourself, all right, I'm pausing here. Am I living serious? Am I serious about God? Am I truly locked in? And am I watchful? And how am I treating others? Okay? Amen. WWJD. I know it's old, but it's not old. But it's really old. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Go ahead, Tammy. Um, I just want to say that I feel like that I was being led to, it was kind of like a praise report to feel God's love and to say that he He wanted me to come back and be um, with the church again and not to push others away and to feel his love. And that, that's what I needed in and that's the thing that um, God has showed me lately, and uh, He never it's right. He never leaves us, and we're the ones that leave Him. And right. we got to quit doing that. We need to say, "Hey, if we're for God, we stay that. We stay that course, and we don't vary from it." Because the devil would love anything more than to catch us off guard at any time in our lives, and and we don't need that in our lives. You know, we need to have that sure that sure foundation of staying strong because this world is going to get, it's going to get hard. It's going to bombard us with everything that's going to come at us. And we got to be ready to take it head on if we can. 
Yeah. You know? the, the name of the Bible college where a lot of the teaching um, that I do was teaching from when I was at the Bible college. That was the name of the college. It was called the Sure Foundation Theological Institute. And oh, it's wow. very important that you have a sure foundation, that it's right, and that you stay strong with God mm -hmm. no matter what's going on. Because the devil will whisper in your ear, more now than ever, more now than ever, you know? Leave the church, leave your friends, leave your spouse, leave your kids, do it on your own, whatever he's, and, and it sounds good when, when he's whispering, it's like, yeah, hey, that sounds pretty good. And if we don't stay strong, that's exactly what we'll do. And that's then right. we'll be hurt. And, and it's not God's plan. If he has a plan for you to do something, he'll confirm it. Yes, he will. It won't yes. just be one mouth saying it. It won't just be you and somebody going, oh, okay, whatever. Half the time, they're not even listening to you. Or the other half of the time, people are being led by the enemy. To, they don't even realize it. Blind spot, right? They're not realizing it. And they're like, oh, yeah. And, and they're leading you astray. So keep strong. Keep strong with God. All right. Anybody else that has anything to say? We're going to close. Otherwise, going once, <laughs> going twice, sold. <laughs> now, I'm really happy to see so many people on tonight. And um, Timothy said he wanted to come on, but it, you know, the hour difference now has made it even later for him. And he was kind of tired tonight. Please keep him in prayer also that uh, we're trying to get that land that um, I had a vision years ago that we were going to have. Um, a children's center with a church operating there and and um, a clinic eventually, school, and all of those things operating out of that one location. And um, we almost had it, and then we it, it kind of fell through. And I spoke with the elders yesterday from that whole area, and they're pretty excited. So keep praying that they'll make that decision, that we'll get some land there, and we'll be able to start that. And they're hoping to get things ready so that, you know, Tara's going. She's going to be there on the ground, just like Jesus is coming on the ground with his feet. She's <laughs> on the ground in Ghana. She'll be on the ground on February 6th. So wow. you need to be praying. She's getting very excited. And some wonderful things are happening. Tara, are you on there? Can you say anything? Or are you asleep? Or what? She hasn't been feeling good. I don't know. She might not be able to. Anyway. All right. I think we're done. Done? Done like dinner, everybody? Done. 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 <laughs> okay. So let's have someone close in prayer. Joanne, are you able to come on and pray for us? Sure. That was quick. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this group, Father God, for the dedication that's here, Lord. And I pray that every message will be taken to heart and practice, Father God. Lord, we don't, we don't want to not be ready and our, our lamp not to be full of oil when you come. We want to be ready, Father God. Continue to prepare us to be ready and share the good news. And that we may be, you said a wise person wins souls. We want to be wise. Help us be soul winners, Father God, to build up your army for, because the time is near. We give you the honor and glory, and I pray blessings over each and every one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Love you all very much. We'll Love you all. We'll see you on Sunday. See you, see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night, Deb, Pastor Debbie. Good night, Mary. Good night, everybody. Good night.